Good afternoon, LEC community. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon for another edition of Ask an Educator. As you know, today is a special edition of Ask an Educator, much anticipated by our community, by me. I I just told Juliana I am I am I'm fangirling right now. I'm I'm nervous because we have the National Teacher 2020 National Teacher of the Year with us today, Juliana Urtube. Um, before we bring her on, we would be remiss to not mention uh, No Kid Hungry and By Share Our Strength, who co-sponsored our event today. So many thank yous to you, um, because this is a, a special, special, special day, a special event um, hosting the first Latina since someone from Latin descent since 2005 to be awarded uh, 2001, or not 2001, the National Teacher of the Year Award. So without further ado, I am so honored, so excited, a little bit nervous <laughs> to introduce you to the 2020 National Teacher of the Year, Juliana Urtube. How are you today? Hello, Susana. I am so happy to be here with you all. Hola a todos y todas. It's beautiful to be able to connect virtually with teachers across the country. This is this is really exciting. Yeah, you're you're out of Las Vegas, right? That's right. Yes, it is. It is exciting. Um, you think about you know pre-COVID, like would have would we have even been doing this, right? But um, for our organization, COVID definitely presented this new opportunity to be able to connect virtually with people. And we're so excited that that means we are talking to you. Um, Juliana, like I said, um, our participants or our um, viewers, our audience be more are more than welcome to interact with us through the comments. Um, make sure you're sharing the live stream because um, I, I want all the little girls and all the little boys um, to see um, people who look like us being represented, um, not only as educators, but as the educator of the year. Um, so to go ahead and get started, Juliana, um, tell us who you are, you know, where you're from, um, and how, how do you feel um, being the teacher of the year? Oh, I am really, really excited. I'm full of pride and joy to be able to um, have this distinct honor. There are, this country is full of amazing educators. And to be able to represent us all, it gives me a sense of purpose and a sense of excitement because I know how amazing teachers are. And so it's really exciting. Um, I was born in Bogota, Colombia, and I came to the United States with my family when I was about five years old. Definitely something that has stayed with me my whole life is this idea of affirming and maintaining our identities, maintaining our connection to our families and our communities, and really, really elevating who we are and making sure other communities um, get to be themselves as well. So that's definitely like a big part of why I'm a teacher. Um, and being named the 2021 National Teacher of the Year is a huge honor. Um, I was just having this conversation not too long ago. You know, I represent so many communities. I represent communities who learn and think differently, who have special educational needs. I represent first generation families, you know, of all ethnicities. I represent the Latino community, the Latinx community. And I do so with a lot of pride. Um, and, you know, I got named in early May and since then, what I've realized is how much our communities were just waiting to be seen and celebrated. And it's not to say that just my being named has done that, but I've seen how when we celebrate communities, when we see communities, the power that it has to transcend the reflection from one person to the other. And really, it has made me understand that this is not about me. This is about we. This is about nosotros, right? All of us together. Okay, Juliana, I don't know if you've watched any of our Ask an Educators, but I will tear up. And I don't know if your intention was to make me cry today, but that, I mean, it, it's it's just, it's a little bit of what our organization's about, right, is um feeling seen, making, creating spaces for people to feel seen. Um, and 
for a lot of Latinx educators, um, we work in isolation, right? We work in silos. And so to be, for you to be um, representing us, and like you said, you know, not, not uh, all these different types of communities um, by being National Teacher of the Year. Also, I am in the past because I know earlier I said uh, 2020 National Teacher of the Year. And then earlier I said 2001. Clearly, um, <laughs> I need to get it together. 2021 National Teacher of the Year. Like I said, you know, there's going to be lots of love in the comments. We have our Professor Edwin. Hi, Edwin from Baltimore. Saludos. Congratulations, he says. Uh, this is actually our CEO and founder, Edgar Palacios, saying hi and how awesome this is. Um, Cecibel is with us. She says, you make us immensely proud. Um, a good friend of mine, Nikki Felicidades. Um, and Melissa, thank you for being with us. Um, she she um, mimics your words. This is about nosotros. Um, thank you again, Juliana, for being here with us. Tell us, um, uh, th there's this concept of a leadership story, right? Um, and everyone has one, uh, whether or not we've vocalized it or on what stage we've told it. Um, we want to hear yours. You know, tell us your leadership story, whether that's your upbringing, your journey as a student, as a teacher, uh, anything that you kind of want to share with us about what, what got you to where you are. So my mentor, Dr. Tanya Holmes Sutton, says that every single teacher leads from their classroom. Whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, we lead from our classroom. And she has this exceptional ability to help teachers see themselves the way she sees us. And I think that's truly what leadership is about. It's about learning. Uh, it's what learning is about. We see the brilliance in the communities that we serve. We see the brilliance in the students that we work with. And really the students that we get to learn and grow with every single day. Um, and so for me, that's what it's about. That's what leadership is about. Um, figuring out a way to bring forward as many people as possible, knowing we're not perfect. We're going to learn along the way. Um, you know, we don't always have the skill, the resources, the knowledge to do the things we want to do. But in community, we do. And so it's about moving forward together. Um, you know, my leadership journey, I think comes from a lot of love that I feel for the communities that I work with. They are mostly Latino, you know, in Vegas, we have such a diversity of people. We have a really big population of folks from Mexico, Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Cuba, um, also from the Philippines and from Vietnam. Those are the communities that I've had a lot of uh, opportunity to work with and also African-American and black communities. And so for me, um, I feel that I have a lot of love and I can see the brilliance that those families have, the gifts that those families have. Um, and I also consider myself a student of the socio-historical frameworks that we all come from, the legacies that we come from, but also, um, you know, the systemic and systematic exclusion and oppression that a lot of communities of color feel. So I feel like we balance that love with that understanding. And so really my leadership journey grew as I learned to listen, All right? You know, it's listening is a skill for me that I'm working on every single day. Latinos, you know that we can have like four conversations at once at the dinner table, you're talking to the person in front of you, the two people next to you. And when someone across the table says something that you're like, oh, you're talking to them too all at once. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's about turning that off and just hyper-focusing on one person and listening to their story, who they are, what makes them them, mm -hmm. um, and then making sure that we're designing spaces that reflect them. Mm -hmm. So my leadership really grew when I learned to listen. When I learned um, that by being humble, I was creating more space for other people. And by looking at design of educational spaces from who is normally excluded, and not intentionally excluded, but who doesn't necessarily feel welcomed in these spaces or safe in this space or peaceful in this space, and how can we design spaces so that they do? So it's unequivocal. Aquí estás y te sientes que puedes ser tú misma, right? Like you can just be yourself. Yeah. And that's really what I think creating learning spaces is for. So we built a garden program mm -hmm. to be able to uh, give a home or a foundation for that amazing community power. Um, and that garden ended up being a bridge builder uh, for our community 
teachers made friendships with families, students not only learned English, but they made friends and they made lifelong connections, you know. Um, and so leadership is something that I'm learning every single day. I don't I don't have it down pat, but I know you got to show up and I know you got to show up authentically to be able to do so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I appreciate a lot of what you said. For those of you who don't know, Juliana is a special ed teacher in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, and I, like I told you before we came on, I was at the EduColor NYC conference on Friday and I heard you speak about the garden program um, and how you were inspired um, partly because of these fences that get put up outside of our schools that make our schools feel exclusive or, or like, uh, or harder to access, right? And this garden that you and your students built together um, kind of helped blur those fences so that the um, symbolism there just really inspired me. I took actually took notes from your speech on Friday um, and I wrote that down, right? Like blurring those fences. Um, how does that lend to who, what kind of leaders you wanna build in your students, right? You talked about listening to their needs and creating a space for them. Um, how does that symbolism of blurring those fences kind of lend to that? Yeah. I think sometimes, and I've gone through this myself as as a child growing up, sometimes we think there's something wrong with us. Mm. Sometimes we think there's a normal and we're not normal, therefore we're subcategorical and so are our families and communities. Um, I felt a whole lot more free when I realized that that wasn't true Um, and that who we are is who we're meant to be. And so when we talk about social justice and inequities and building more equitable spaces, I think the first thing we have to do is remove the fact that it could possibly be our students, their families, or their community's fault, Mm -hmm. right? So I've been really particular about my language. Um, So one of them is blurring those lines, blurring those visible and invisible barriers that do exist for our community. Sometimes they're very visible like language, right? Sometimes we're excluded because we don't speak the language that everybody else there is speaking. But sometimes they're invisible, like this invisible uh, sensation or vibe, for lack of a better word, that our families feel when they're on campus, when they don't feel like they're good enough, right? And I never want any family to feel that. I want families to know that schools are doing the hard work to be able to see their brilliance and see their gifts. Um, Another example is that I don't call my students English language learners. I call them linguistically gifted because that's what they are. I feel that anybody that brings other languages forward and to share and to be part of a community is bringing a gift. And so what happens when we switch how we frame, how we see our students, their families in the community? This is something that's been coming up the last couple of days is you as an educator have to have an asset mindset, both about me as a student and about my families and my communities. You can't negotiate and you can't have that asset mindset towards me because I'm your child or a child in your class or I'm cute or I'm young or you see my promise. You also have to see my family's promise and my community's promise. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that that's where the hard work is. Um, And I mean the pun of the hard work, right? Because it's truly about having todo corazón forward. So in terms of building leadership in my students, I think the thing that it is, is creating a space where students can learn more about who they are, Mm -hmm. learn about their role within their community. And it's balanced with this interconnectedness, right? Like I know who I am. I know how my personal, you know, nervous system operates. I know how to regulate my emotions. I know how to problem solve. But I also understand that I'm one person within this community. And so there is um, a wealth of well-being when we're interconnected and when we really know about that role. So I think it's a a little bit of both, um, building up the self, but then also making sure that we're uh, in in congruence and harmony with the community. Yeah, I I think that's something that's not often, not talked about often enough is... um, being open-minded to learning about the community in which you serve, right? So for those of us who perhaps don't live in the neighborhood or the community where um, we teach um, and who, and all of us as teachers um, have life experiences 
don't have all of the life experiences that our students have, right? And so in order to best serve being open-minded to learning about what works best for our students, for their families, what does the um, teacher-parent relationship look like for, for uh, different cultures perhaps that I'm not as familiar with? Um, it, we get really boggled down with the grit and the scope and sequence and the curriculum and all of the policies, right? Um, so I really am glad that you mentioned that. It's actually something I'm really passionate about. Um, to shout out some people who are with us. Hi, Ruth. Um, I'm with this 100%. Educators need representation too. Um, another reason why I'm so glad, Juliana, that you could be here with us today because for all of our viewers, um, again, to see to see Latinos doing it and, and doing the tough work um, around the country, right? Uh, Angel's with us today, says, hi, hermana, sending love, hashtag asset mindset. Do you know this? You person? got the state teacher of the year from New Jersey right there. Hey, hey, hey. what's yeah. up? Congratulations on your baby. Yay. He just had a baby. Oh. Sorry, I'm putting it out there. <laughs> no, congratulations on him. He's sending love from New Jersey. Um, love it. Thank you for being with us today. Um, I mean, just seeing these comments is just making me light up because, um, it's what you talked about, right? Needing, um, represent, or I'm sorry, what Ruth talked about needing representation and a lot of what the LEC preaches, right? Um, you talked about, um, some hurdles kind of as you were talking already, but were there, um, what have been some significant hurdles in your career? Um, that have made your passion a little bit a little bit more difficult. Yeah, and I think this is something that educators face um, across the country, and our stories will resonate with each other. Um, and so I think I'll, I'll speak a little bit more collectively from the teachers that I've grown to know and love, teachers that have shared their stories, and, and myself. Um, I think one of the things that is really challenging is the invisible tax that a lot of teachers of color uh, contribute to at schools. Um, and while we're really excited to be able to support translation services, um, be build bridge builders, explain cultural nuances, you know, because uh, my husband says this, he's, he's an amazing, amazing musician and professor at the University of Las Vegas. He always talks about it being a mutual cultural gap. Right. We perceive like we're at fault for this gap, but really it's a mutual cultural gap and it doesn't have to be a problem. Right. It can be about us, all educators saying, you know what, this is a mutual cultural issue or mutual linguistic gap. Let's both work together to really adjust. And so I think that um, while those roles have really filled me with a lot of confidence to move forward in education. I know that for some educators, it weighs them down because, you know, um, every teacher has so many layers of their work mm -hmm. and our work isn't sometimes respected, right? Sometimes, you know, you will hear, oh, you don't want to be a teacher. There's, there's, they don't get treated well and they don't make enough money. And, yeah. you know, and so we need the support from community to keep going. You know, we need community to see teaching as what it is you know, something that commands expertise, something that commands a commitment to lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. And so I think that those are some of the challenges, right? Also, mm -hmm. doing something brand new um, will always present challenges because you're the one who's kind of paving the way. And so at our school, the garden was completely brand new. And there were some logistical challenges, like not knowing where the lead pipes were. So not knowing exactly where we could dig and where we couldn't dig. And so like some of those logistical, how do we problem solve around that? How do we do that? Um, and some of them were like, how do we make sure we're building this garden with community voice? You can't just jump into it and build a huge garden and expect it to resonate with the community. So we made the decision to move really slowly. We built the garden over the course of six years. Um, and we did so no, ensuring that we could sustain it and at the same time we could reflect community in the building, right, in the murals that were painted. And so I think in retrospect that was a really good way to get through this challenge of maybe we don't have the skills to listen and have the best relationships now. Let's do so little by little 
Let's really show our community that we are deserving of their trust in us and let's move forward. Um, there's so many challenges in education. I know every teacher listening feels me and knows that there's so many more. Um, but I think one of the things that just kept me going all the time was my, my community, right? Um, and, and my colleague community. I have so many teacher friends that I can just send them a text and I'm like, hey, I need your help on this. Or, hey, this happened. What would you do? How, give me your thoughts because I'm kind of lost on this. And so to kind of have that network of people who have my back really helps us like get around and go through those challenges. We grow from challenges. Ultimately, they, they deter our response to challenge, you know, really shows who we are. And so I think I teach my students that, that it's okay to feel challenges. Um, and we just got to push through them. Yeah. Um, well, you, you talked about some elements of, of community and mentorship have kind of come up um, in your answers that I want to come back around to. But before that, um, like I said, I got to hear you speak recently. And I, I know a little bit about the garden and, and all of that. But since it's a big reference point for you, if you want to share with us kind of um, what what your garden is, how it how it came to fruition. You know who was a part of it. Um, your students call you Miss Earth. Um, I heard one of your students in a video call you Miss Earth Earth Pube, right? Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, oh, that nickname. I love that nickname, uh, and I'll tell you the story of that too. Yeah. Uh, so that was at Crestwood Elementary. That was the previous school that I was working at. I'm now a proud Booker Bobcat. I work at Kermit Booker Elementary in the west side of Las Vegas. Um, but at Crestwood, we built that garden because we wanted a space for everybody to be able to come together. Sometimes I think that we are just not able to be afforded the time to build um, like horizontal relationships, right? In schools, the relationships are often very vertical with the teacher and the power dynamics between families and students and teachers. And we wanted to kind of like just flip that. Like, how can we do that work side by side? It's yeah. really, you know, it's a pretty straightforward concept. It's, why don't we build um, a space where teachers and family members can literally build a garden bed and get to know each other? And that's how we build the relationships. And so we built this garden really slowly over the course of six years, like I said. We started with just six little garden beds, five little garden beds, mm -hmm. and we would go out there to teach and it was a hot mess because it's really windy in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Pencils would fly everywhere, papers would fly everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the students love learning out there. And so we said, okay, why don't we start like building the infrastructure for a classroom? Um, so we built a table, we built a bench, we built a whiteboard, and the families helped us do that all. You know, one of the stories that I tell in that, uh, that I told in the Edu Conference, Edu Color Conference, was the story of how we built this adobe bench. For those of us who know, we know that adobe is a traditional um, way of building, right? You take dirt and straw and water and you mush it all up and it takes patience. And so um, we worked with this phenomenal ed teacher. She's still one of my dearest friends, Jessica Penrod. And she helped us really bring in these ideas about how to build thinking of the earth, thinking of like natural patterns that happen. And so she was, oh, she made, she's, she's part of the reason that this garden has flourished the way it did. But basically we laid out tarp and we threw a bunch of like mud and dirt and water and straw and the kids like kind of would step kids. on it. Right now, with the kids? With the kids. <laughs> and then literally handful by handful, we built this bench. Um, and, you know, I can tell so many students' story through the building of that bench, because that bench had to go through three or four different phases. Um, and there's, there's just a power in people building their spaces, right? Very metaphorically, but very literally as well. And so we just kept building and building little by little. Eventually, we're like, oh, we have this really big people program. We need more food. So then we took down across the, the other side of the garden and built just a bunch of garden beds and fruit trees and flat, like a bunch of flowers. So we had all the pollinators. Um, and we were known as the gnomies, the gnomes who are homies, you know, the caretakers of the garden. And students to this day, I live in the neighborhood. I still live two blocks down from Crestwood. So I get to see my students. In fact, uh, one of the families lives 
like diagonal from me. Mm-hmm. So over COVID, it was something that kept me going was to see them outside playing. Um, I was like, okay, we're going to get through this. Um, and, you know, there I've seen them grow up. One of them just graduated high school. Um, and so to this day, the students in the community still call themselves know me. Mm-hmm. And so that's where the nickname Miss Earth came from. Um, one day I was in class with some of my students and I looked down at their paper and it was one of those like time tests that I had to give. Um, and next to teacher, my student wrote Miss Earth. Oh. And I was like, oh, yeah. so-and-so, tell me about that. And he just looked at me and he goes, you don't know that we all call you Miss Earth today? I'm like, no, I, you know, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. And then from then on, it just kind of caught. And then eventually the bay dropped off and it just became Miss Earth. Oh. And I think that I um, hold on to that honor really dearly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and how how much um, student identity and self-confidence, self-esteem, um, self, uh, you know, the way we view ourselves, how much of that is being developed through this this project of the garden and through your openness to be, um, you know, vulnerable with the kids, right? Because I, I'm assuming here, but um, was this your first garden, first garden to this scale that you had built? Yeah, so like- Yeah, girl, and I didn't know how to garden before. <laughs> yeah. See, like this, like this, you being vulnerable too and being like, we're gonna learn together, we're gonna make mistakes together. Unfortunately, uh, we've made school into this thing where kids feel they have to be perfect. They have to, you know, follow this structure and this rigidity that doesn't work for all of our students. Uh, You mentioned time tests that you, quote unquote, have to give, right? Um, And so unfortunately, even when we know that some things aren't what's best for kids, throwing in these kind of projects and um, elements to the school day probably make quite a bit of difference um, for your students. Angel is with us still. Hi, Angel says, last year showed us how large our networks can become. Absolutely. We've got help. Um, yeah, for sure. So did you teach through, through uh, did Las Vegas go to virtual learning and all of that as well? And you taught through that um, as well? Yes, yes. So I'm part of the Clark County School District and it's pretty much Southern Nevada. Um, and yes, we did virtual from March until about February of the following school year. Okay. We um, we didn't stop teaching. I think that that's something that teachers are like trying to shout from the mo- rooftops. We didn't stop teaching, not for a moment. Right. <laughs> but um, we physically, in the physical building, welcomed back students starting from pre-K into second, second grade, I believe, mm-hmm. um, first. And then we started kind of meeting in the older grades. Um, but I can't tell you the emotion that I felt watching the students come back into the building. Mm-hmm. Mind you, the, I was this is my first year at Booker, the new school that I was teaching at. Mm-hmm. And to see all these students that I had, I had gotten to know virtually, just like mm-hmm. walking down the hallway with space, because, you know, everybody had to put those stickers down to make sure the kids could see the space. Mm-hmm. They just looked so proud and so brave with their backpacks and their masks. And they were just like parading down the hallway. And I got chills and tears because I was just so excited Mm -hmm. to see them back. Because, yes, I think everybody is with me on how difficult it was, how emotionally taxing it was. Um, You know, for some students, virtual learning was great. You know, they really excelled. And for a lot of other students, they needed the emotional, social, physical connection to others. And so, yeah, we did virtual for for a long time, for Mm -hmm. a very long time. We did our best. Mm-hmm. I love that you said that, that teachers are probably all like, look, learning still happens. We, we still taught, you know, um, because the some some of the um, assumption maybe is that um, learning didn't happen. Right. And that teaching didn't happen. And that's not necessarily the case. And there is a percentage of kiddos who kind of thrive with the online stuff like they liked um being able to do work when they could and and hopping on when they would like there were some people some kiddos in my family who liked it Uh, you know an overwhelming majority who really was like okay i'm ready (laughs) to go back to school right um but hopefully um this moves us toward as a society um being more appreciative of of what schools 
are and can be for our communities, um, what teachers mean for for schools and for communities and for kids, right? I mean, the kids in my life were like, I cannot wait to go back to school. These are kids who are like, you'd have to drag them out of bed in the morning, who like, right? But like during COVID, it was like, gosh, I miss my friends, I miss my teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and so shout out to you for, um, you know, obviously killing it in, in virtual learning. Um, and <laughs> uh, it wasn't an easy an easy feat. Fit. I, feat. I um, I taught during the beginning of, of COVID in that March through June of 2020. Um, and, you know, I've heard of it as explained as emergency um, teaching and not, you know, typical teaching. And, and it's like, yeah, we had to make some shifts. Um, but like Angel said, you know, our networks, being able to reach out to um, people from around the country and students being able to see things from around the country. I mean, I know Harvard opened up some things for free virtually to get students engaged that way. So um, anyway, uh, so you are the first uh, Latinx educator since 2005. Um, at the LEC, we do quite a bit of research about how many Latinx educators are in the pipeline in the profession. Here in the Kansas City Metro, less than 1% are um, identify as Latinx. On a national scale, it's less than 8%. Um, what does it mean for you um, to be the first um, person of Latinx descent since 2005? Girl, I don't have words. <laughs> I, I really don't have words because um, it's really beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, growing up, I kind of, like, I think so many of us struggled with, like, am I Colombian enough? Am I American enough? Where does this, where does this, like, how do I do all of it, right? Um, I'm referencing my partner again, who is just brilliant. He has this line in his music that says, uh, somos de aquí, somos de allá. Yeah. Like, we are from here and we are from there. So when I was named, I was really excited to see how Colombia was going to respond. I didn't think it was going to be a big deal there, but I was just like, we'll see, you know. Um, and what ended up happening was a huge response from Colombia. I have this picture of my grandmother holding up the newspaper the day that I was on the front cover. And like... <laughs> When my tia sent it to me, I was like, literally, las lágrimas así, like, Phew. I know. I know. <laughs> because I could feel, just like for other people, how much our community needed that uplifting. It wasn't just about me. It was about a whole community. Um, and the acceptance that I got from Colombia, the embrace that I got from Colombia meant so much to me. Because I know a lot of us hold, sometimes it feels like heartache. Sometimes it feels like nostalgia. Sometimes it feels like separation, you know? And so for me, it was just really powerful to feel that embrace. Even mm -hmm. as, you know, an adult, I, I still needed that affirmation. And knowing that that affirmation wasn't just for me, it was for our whole community. Mm -hmm. I got messages from people saying, I, I watched this with my daughter, you know, the CBS um, naming mm -hmm. when they announced who the announcement, who, who was a 2021 National Teacher of the Year. I watched it with my daughters because I wanted them to see that it's possible. I have teacher friends who made sure that they played it in their classroom so that their uh, Latina students could see it. Yeah. And so I just, uh, we have so much work to do. I don't negate that. Yeah. I just think it's so important to stop and celebrate, mm -hmm. stop and celebrate and tell our stories, right? When I have the opportunity to tell my story, I always talk about my mom and my family. Um, and give credit to that tenacity, that creativeness, that hustle, but also call out the systems that really criminalize, criminalize the Latino community. Yeah. It's not to say that we're the only community that's criminalized, but you know, um, I talk a lot about how my family had the, the privilege of, of migrating with documentation yeah. and my dad had the language and we were able to migrate safely that is not a privilege afforded to many within our narrative, um, certainly not to many of my students. And so I feel that I have um, a responsibility to both celebrate us and then to talk about these injustices, to talk about you know the fact that we still have 
the crisis that we have at the border, that children are still in detention, that mm -hmm. families are still in detention, that people are criminalized for what used to be a civil consideration, right? Um, and so I, we can't ask for joyous and just schools. We can't advocate for joyous and just schools if we're not also doing it outside of our schools. We have to understand that all these systems really impact our community. Um, and so, yeah, I think your original question was, how do I feel being the first Latina? And I feel all the feelings, <laughs> um, but mostly yeah. pride, pride yeah. and like an eagerness to continue the work. Um, uh, an eagerness to amplify these stories that make us who we are mm -hmm. um, and to do so in a way that disrupts the narrative, right? Um, I wanted to tell my story without anybody being like, ay pobrecita, yeah. right? Because yeah. once you see me as a pobrecita, you don't see me as somebody who's quite capable of pushing forward Mm -hmm. um, and I say that like, and I have a funny feeling when I say that because I understand there's a lot of systemic issues at play with that. But what I mean by that is that it's never the kid, it's never the person who there's anything missing or lacking, right? It's our access to certain things that yeah. don't give us the opportunity to um, excel or see our potential or self-fulfill um, goals. And so it's with that balance that I take this charge that I'm so excited for, um, that I know that is full of a lot of learning. Yeah. And not just for me, I just got back from being uh, with all the state teachers of the year from across the country. We just spent a week together. Um, not everybody was able to be there. Um, however, I got the chance to listen to my colleagues' stories. Mm -hmm. And for I felt this immense pride of being part of this collective teachers across this country who get it, who are committed to the work, who have affirming stories that do disrupt that narrative. Um, and so I think that that's going to fuel me for a very long time, just that week with them. And, um, you know, again, I'm reminded how amazing the teachers in this country are. Yeah. And I do want to see more Latina teachers. I do want to see more people of color teaching. I think that it's really important. However, we have to commit to the work yeah. to make this profession a profession that is truly a safe place for people of color to grow old in, right? Yeah. So like looking at things like we shouldn't have to do unpaid internships to get our teaching license. How yeah. many of us are just like, nope, I can't do that, right? Yeah. I know I work three jobs during my student teaching just to get myself through it, right? Um, we need better pay, we need better respect. We also need our families to encourage us to be teachers, you know? Um, so, so yeah, there's, yeah. it's all of that. <laughs> all, all of that. I mean, and several times there I had to, Lori's with me, Lori's a good friend of mine of the LEC, like teared up several times there. And Lori says, congratulations. Oh, um, God, yes. Because, I mean, like you said, there's so much there, right? I mean, when you talk about your grandma, I'm like, oh, already, you know, like tears, right? Because um, you add in the element that that uh, of, of the struggle of immigration, right? And our gram, you know, our grandmothers still being in our native countries and watching us from there and being just so proud and look, I can't even imagine uh, the pride that your family is feeling right now. Um, you talked about the, um, you know, the inequities that students of color and people of color are yeah. facing in the school system and how. Um, you know, us being committed to to make that happen. But, you know, you spending a week with the teachers of the year and seeing how dedicated, I mean, I see it all the time in the LEC, you know, how committed people are to making a change, to being um, the person for, for students, right? To being, um, to seeing the change through for, for our students. Um, it's hard work, but, um, and it's a lot. Like you said, there's so many emotions that come with like, being the first lucky, right? Like all of these things um, and and a lot of hard work, right? Uh, so yeah. I, I'm, you've, you've said this, you've answered this um, in several different types, several different ways, um, but kind of looking at how um, you serve uh, a demographic of immigrant children, immigrant families, perhaps some undocumented families, uh, migrant communities, um, 
when has there been a time that you've stepped outside of what someone would consider the typical role of a teacher to serve the whole child, right? To serve the whole student or the whole, you, you talked about serving the family and the community just as much as you serve the students. Um, that's, that's, that's tough. You know, it's one of the reasons why I got burnt out after, you know, just six years. Um, it's not an easy task. Tell us about a time when you did that and how that kind of keeps you going. Yeah. First, I think everybody's dying to see. Maya oh, my God. Yes. There it is. Sorry, I have issues with like the space. There it is. There's my abuelita. <laughs> yeah, with the picture. And that's, I think that's the same picture you all are using. So. <laughs> well, Yana, that's the sweetest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, you know, and uh, she's just so beautiful. She's so beautiful. So it was really beautiful to honor her in that way. Yeah. Um, how have I stepped outside of my role? Uh, let's see. So there's. And I won't get too too in depth, but there has been times that I needed my community. You know, we were going through really difficult things, yeah. and my community stepped up for me. And that was mostly the moms from Crestwood Elementary, oh, wow. who knew that I was in need in terms. I needed some emotional support. I needed some support that only like the abuelitas in Mexico would know how to do. Yep. And the moms just surrounded us and embraced us with that support and that love. And I think that that made me realize that, one, this is a two-way street, mm -hmm. um, that what we offer community, community also offers us. And so I think that we need to understand as educators um, that it's two ways, and just as much as we fill others, others can fill us. Yeah. Um, I think about, um, you know, the strengths that, I have been able to see just because of my unique perspective. So during COVID, I had many families tell me, hey, I'm so-and-so speaking so much Spanish and they normally don't speak this much Spanish. Mm -hmm. And we know that it's important to go back to school, but we're grateful for this time so that so-and-so can be really comfortable in Spanish and speak to their abuelita again, yeah. right? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. a time that I'm like, I've been like just floored. Mm -hmm. Or a time that moms have said, hey, I listen to so-and-so's class all day long and I'm learning so much English and I'm so proud, <laughs> you know? So yeah. uh, I think that I'm uniquely positioned in, yeah. in the way that only a teacher that reflects their community can be to see these the brilliance. And yeah. our humanity is not for negotiation. Mm -hmm. Somos quien somos and we are beautiful and we're strong and we are imperfect and that is okay, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but just this deep and immense pride um, and I think that sometimes um, teachers, we see how we fill others, but not how others fill us. And so I think in the same way, the way we teach can be healing for us. I know for me, when I started learning about growth mindset um, and mindfulness, so much more of myself made sense. Mm -hmm. I also learned how to manage my emotions and problem solve through teaching my students about different parts of the brain and like natural, normal ways that the brain processes information that causes us to have big, big emotions and that all emotions are okay. And that we were a little community that supported each other. My students have seen me cry yeah. multiple times. And thankfully we had like a, a growth mindset corner where you could go no judgment and calm down. And I had a student walk me there. <laughs> Aww. and bring me chocolate. <laughs> I had teachers who have seen me cry, colleagues who have seen me cry, and who, like, one time I was just under my desk, I was like, I, this is, I just, I'm having a moment. And all of a sudden I hear, like, a and it was my co-teacher, Chelsea Pate, who slid a box of Kit Kats under my desk so I could just, like, sit there while I was ready to get back up. Um, and that's, that's, how we step out of teacher role into commu community member role, yeah. right? Um, and I think that that's really important. It's really humbling, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's really important. And, and it's in, in certain ways, it's really sustained me. Yeah, I, I mean, that takes a lot of courage and vulnerabil vulnerability, um, especially when we've been told that, that teachers are the experts and like we're giving to kids, right? Like what we have, we're now giving to you. Um, and that, that deficit mindset of like, there's very little you have to bring to us, right? So there's some vulnerability 
and some um, courage that goes with that. But and and maybe parents and community members or or school leadership may, you know, um, side eye you for a little bit. You know, like why are you, you know, being that vulnerable with your students? I remember moments that I had like that. Right. Um, you said something that that stuck out to our our founder Edgar. He says our human humanity is not up for negotiation. I love that, and actually, um, it's a lot of how I describe the way that we um, treat children in schools. Right? We we take their humanity away from them, and we and and we um, impose on them these deadlines and these tasks and these to do lists. Right? Um, and and with very little consideration for the humanity, right? Um, you also said something during the EduColor um, Summit on Friday, um, you know, you wanna be a part of a school and you wanna help build a school that deserves our the children, that deserves the students. Um, can you tell us about that? Cause that, that quote I put in my notes, cause I was like, we often think the opposite, right? Like let's uh, like, uh, what 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 do you have you know and does that fit here like no, no no how do we deserve the kiddos who come here yeah uh wow so i think one of the things that has helped shape the way i teach and how i see community is really this understanding um and the way i phrase it is this other people might phrase it differently um but you know i don't want kids compliance i want their collaboration and so how do we build systems that intentionally look at how communities have been criminalized and say, in this space, that's not happening. Yeah. And one of the ways we do it is through collaboration. So I often give this example. When it's the beginning of the school year, um, I generate you know, our norms together with our students. Mm -hmm. But we spend some time looking at nature, you know, looking at how little ducks walk. And they watch how the little ducks walk it. And I ask them to use their intuition, their observation to tell me, why? Why do you think they're walking a line? And the kids as young as preschool, kindergarten can tell you, oh, so nobody gets lost. So if somebody gets hurt or distracted or they forget to keep walking, we know. And in the world of special education, this happens. Um, so that we stay together, so that um, we get wherever we have to go fast because maybe there's a predator lying in the grass, et cetera. Um, and so that instills in all of us this collectivity, this collectiveness about why we gotta do the things that we gotta do. And so sometimes, yes, we have to comply to certain things, but I want students to feel like I'm not authority. Like I'm not, a, I do really terribly with authority figures anyway, but I don't want to be an authority figure to them or to the families. Um, I want to have like a shared role in this. And so I think that that's really crucial um, when we're looking at our educational spaces for ensuring that we're not taking away our students' humanity, right? Because sometimes we do it and we don't even know that we've done it. Yeah. Um, and remind me the second part of your question because I got so deep into that one. I know. Um, you talked about our schools deserving our children. Ah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about... When you look at the legacy of our families, of Latino and migrant families, and you know, I want to be really intentional that this is a very large community. It's not just Latinos that are migrants. Yeah. Um, you know, we have folks from Africa, from, folks from all over the world yeah. who migrate. And so sometimes I want to make sure that we're talking about everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at what it means to migrate and what it means to leave home, for whatever the reason is, nobody wants to leave their home. Nobody wants to like forget everything and move forward and be separated for their, from their parents for 20 years or not be able to return home for a funeral of a loved one or leave their country in a time of war or yeah. famine or et cetera, right? So we have to understand that nobody takes this decision lightly um, and they know that they're coming to a country where they are criminalized, where it's perceived as like a right way to migrate which, you know, if you really look at it, like the law of migration, it's not easy. It's not an easy thing for people to easily migrate. Yeah. With that being said, when they get here, we want to have schools that deserve that kind of sacrifice, um, mm -hmm. that deserve that kind of resiliency, and that deserve that kind of contribution. I think so often 
migrants are normalized and socialized to think that we constantly have to be proving our existence, proving our um, deservability, which pins us against each other, yeah. right? And we don't want that. And so schools really need to think really critically about how do we design our spaces so that that's not even an option for families to think that this isn't the school that their children deserve. Yeah. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, our, our parents, these are, these are our, their parents, you know, best things, like, you know, best, mm -hmm. best everything that they're sending to school. And so to treat that lightly um, is a mistake that oftentimes schools do make. But um, if it's something we're more mindful about, we have teachers mindful about. Um, and that makes a difference. That makes a world of a difference for some students and some families, you know? Absolutely, yeah. I keep, I mean, there's been several times in the conversation where I've teared up because also the LEC community knows I'm a crier, but um, because like- I cry all the time too. You saw it at the EDU conference, I cry all the time. <laughs> I think everybody who watched the CBS Good Morning America saw me ball and like, yes. <laughs> I couldn't even get the words out because <laughs> I was crying so much. So tears I are embraced. I cried, I cried on Friday oh. at the conference. <laughs> But, but the, you know, I guess it, it shows up as crying for you and I maybe, but like just thinking about that student, you know, you talked about the sacrifice made in immigration and, and what some of our kids saw that, that I, I'm, I'll never see, right, probably. Um, what some of our kids and their families overcame that, um, and actually many of them in the name of education. Um, mm -hmm. For my family in particular, they knew that educational opportunities weren't, and, and work opportunities weren't much of an option where they were from in Mexico. And so in the name of education, in the name, you know, my parents will say it, it was so that you all could get a better education. Mm -hmm. um, and then for them to show up at our schools, like we're the, we're the, we, we feel like the golden ticket to these families, right? And then for us to take that lightly would is a mistake, right, or, or would be a mistake. Um, I'm really sad that our time is coming to a close because I'm just like fangirling and also like just, mm -hmm. yes, everything you're saying, I'm like, yes. Um, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, what, um, what piece of advice do you have for um, either other Latinx educators, a first year teacher, um, what, whoever kind of you would like to speak to um, and give them a piece of advice, we would love to hear it. Yeah. And before I do that, I do want to shout out all of the people in this country who ensured that kids got fed over COVID. Mm -hmm. I remember that that was, um, that, that, that you were in collaboration with an organization yes. that ensured that kids have food. And yeah. I think the unsung heroes of the COVID pandemic and, and the education world are the um, cafeteria workers. Oh my God. They braved COVID before we understood how it would pass, whatever. They braved COVID to make sure every single family had um, access for food. The policymakers to make sure that, um, that food was free for everybody was such a beautiful thing because we understood that having access to food is more than just funds for food. It's a whole family organization, it's a whole thing. And so to take that off of families' um, laps and say, we got you, I think was so incredibly beautiful. Yes, shout out um, to, to No Kid Hungry by Share Our Strength. Uh, they co-sponsored our yeah. event today. But yes, um, yeah. uh, the, the unsung heroes, the cafeteria workers, the people, um, I don't know how Las Vegas did it, but I know in our district it was like they they wrangled everybody up and started doing um, paper bag paper um, bag lunches, and parents could come pick them up, and the kids could come pick them up. It was a lot of work, and mm -hmm. at the beginning of a pandemic, we didn't understand like do masks right. work? Do they not work? You know what is the distance, right? And these cafeteria workers were there, like handing these. Yeah. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. And just, no, 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 it's, it's that exactly. Um, and uh, I, I shout out to my school district because I remember we would call in and say, hey, these food sites you all have are too far. The families are working, mm -hmm. it's too hot. And then the next day or two, they'd open up one closer. 
or there was requirements about needing your students' IDs and some kids left theirs at school, some kids lost theirs. Okay, yes, yeah, families don't have them, no problem. You know, so they were really receptive to that feedback, both from families and I'm sure teachers everywhere calling in. Um, and it was just beautiful to see the community coming together. So I think that my advice leans into that. Mm -hmm. My advice leans into the fact that know that you're in community. Know that a school is your community, right? From the cafeteria workers, to the custodial workers, to the administration, to the paraprofessionals, to the nurse, like that is your family. And so pour into them as much as you can because that is what sustains educators, right? Know their strengths, know their stories. Um, and really just, I, I struggle with this question because I think that it's tough to give teachers advice without the relationship, right? Yeah. So I um, am committed to building relationships with teachers throughout their whole journey and their profession and know that, you know, my Twitter handle, you can DM me and I'm, I'm here for you if, you, if, if that's helpful. Um, mm -hmm. But just build that community and know that you are always in community. And so I think the other like really logistical, tangible advice I have is when you go to a school and you're uh, applying for a position, you're also interviewing that school. So make sure that that school is a good fit for you. Make sure you and your administration, if you don't share completely the same vision, that you have trust with the administrator to amplify the vision of the school um that you are in a community that will respect you especially for teachers of color like well that will have your back because we experience different um challenges uh know that you have power in selecting the school that you select and so mm -hmm. know your worth know your worth and that your safety and that your well-being is just as important as being able to work at a school um that you love the school has to love you back you know what, Juliana, I don't think that gets said enough. Um, I think I think um, burnout happens in a lot of teachers for a lot of different reasons. But if if it's if it, if the if it's that the school isn't a good culture fit, the the administration is a good isn't a good culture fit. Right. And and it's it's just a matter of changing schools or districts or grade levels. Right. Like maybe you're burnt out because you thought early education was for you, but you'd be a great fit in middle or high school, right? Um, because burnout happens so quickly um, in teachers, uh, I think maybe we 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 missed the opportunity to just say, hey, let's check it, something else out. Um, on the screen, you see Juliana's uh, Twitter. Um, what is that? Handle. Handle. <laughs> I couldn't think of the name. Twitter handle, uh, Juliana Urtube3. Um, as she said, follow her on Twitter. Um, and then just really quick, Ceci with the um, No Kid Hungry team from Team No Kid Hungry, Hungry here and couldn't agree more. Schools are nutrition hubs and cafeteria staff are hunger heroes. Absolutely. Hunger heroes. I love that. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, thank you, Ceci, for being with us this afternoon. Um, Juliana, I cannot congratulate you enough um, I cannot thank you enough for the commitment you have to your students, to your school, to your city, um, to teach. I mean, you talked about mentoring and, and connecting with and giving advice to other teachers. That's huge, you know, huge for a lot of educators who are feeling alone, who are feeling burnt out. Um, it's huge for students for you to consider their humanity. Um, it's huge for schools for you to consider uh, the culture of the neighborhood. So all of these things that you're doing, I'm so, so grateful for. On behalf of, of me personally, on behalf of the Latinx Education Collaborative, on behalf of our community, congratulations. Um, thank you for taking your time with us. Uh, let's stay connected. I can't wait to see what you're up to next. Yeah, for sure. And thank you for this opportunity to connect and learn and grow with you all, Susana, your work, um, the work of the LEC, the work of No Kid Hungry. I think these are just all the puzzle pieces that coming together really make um, the possibilities possible. So thank you for your work and know that I'm here um, to amplify our stories and I'm just really grateful to everybody who tuned in and, and was part of this conversation. Um, muchísimas gracias. Yes. Well, uh, Juliana, until next time, 
Um, LEC community, thank you for joining us for our special edition of Ask an Educator this afternoon. Um, follow us on social media if you're not yet, because um, that's how we get all of this information and great stuff out. Juliana, thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Buenas noches. Bye.